So today's goal is to get the propeller back together and ready to install on the boat. <laughs> and there's Kepler. There is some fairly heavy looking pitting along here, along here. It, it's not that deep. Like if I close my eyes and ran my fingers over it, you don't really feel it. I mean, obviously you feel it, but it doesn't feel that deep. And for that reason, part of me is tempted to just sand it until it is smooth. But there's a couple problems with that. It was originally designed to have a certain thickness and profile and that's what it's got now. And I would probably screw it up if I tried to sand it back. The right way to fix this would be to get rid of all of the pitting, taking it to a machinist and welding some new bronze, smoothing it out. I could send it to PYI. If they weren't across the border and it wasn't quite as expensive, I'd be really tempted to do that. But I'm looking at like 750 bucks US, which is over, geez, with current interest rate, like 1100 interest rate. Exchange rate, that's like 1100 Canadian. I just can't do that right now on top of what I would probably end up being hit with shipping, considering how heavy it is and duty with it crossing the border. So that might be what I end up doing, but later, or I might be able to find a prop company to do it here in Canada. In fact, I've got a name of one in Ontario already I might be able to use. But all of that is outside of what I can do now because I wanna get in the water sooner than later. While I was traveling and not able to directly work on the boat, I was using a lot of time trying to figure out parts I could order and do homework so that when I got back, I could hit the ground running. One of the things I've decided I was going to do, separate of the problem with the pitting, is I wanna cover this in prop speed. Now, as I understand, they're very concerned about making sure it's not listed as an anti-foul, but instead as a foul release. So it doesn't stop things from growing, it just makes it so you should be able to brush them off fairly easily. Now, prop speed is not cheap. Even this small thing was, oh geez, I remember exactly. It was a lot of money. Um, and I was trying to think about how I was going to fare the propeller blades. And one of the ideas I had was to use um, epoxy. So it's West Systems G-Flex. I was talking to West Systems or one of the resellers about what epoxy I could use to try to fill in the gaps. And they were suggesting this particular, it's the G-Flex 655 thickened epoxy. I've never used it before, I have no clue how to use it. But the goal would be to get all the paint and debris out, which I'm gonna do in this episode, and then fill it with this and sand it until it's fair and then cover it in prop speed. Now, when I was talking to the West Systems folks, they were saying, we don't know if prop speed is going to stick to it, go talk to prop speed. So I did, and they were like, we only know that it sticks to metal. We don't know if it's going to stick to epoxy. I didn't get told it wouldn't. I was just told that they don't know. So we're going to do some science this summer. I'm going to figure this out with the epoxy, cover it with prop speed, and then when I haul out at the end of the year, we'll see whether it's peeled away or, or, or. I'm gonna have to get this prop fixed if I keep it, so it's not a big deal. One of the other problems about potentially grinding this back to get down to a smooth surface is throwing balance off. Considering this pitting was already on the boat when I brought it home and I motored a lot on the way home, I never noticed any vibration. And with the electric motor, I'll never be going above 1000 RPM. I think this is rated for a maximum of 1500 RPM, but I'm gonna to try to aim for like 1000 RPM. So it's not like it's gonna be spinning at a super high speed, but leaving as much bronze as on as possible will help keep it in balance. And this is obviously not the same weight, but I think the pitting is relatively equal, all things considered, it's gonna be close enough. Now, a couple other things I had to get. I had to get a new cutlass bearing. There you go. See the channels that are in there? The idea is the water can get into the channels and helps lubricate the prop shaft. This is what sits on the, uh, the strut. If you remember the episode when I was taking the propeller off, I could grab the shaft and went clunk, 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 clunk. It's because this was worn. So this is the replacement. I also got a new tricolor for the top of the mast. The one I have works, but it's old and the lenses are really foggy and I don't want to go back up the mast later if I can avoid it. So I got this one. I still need to get the one that goes, uh, the anchor light slash deck light needs to be replaced, but I haven't bought that yet. I also got lots and lots and lots 
and lots of grease for the propeller. The reason I got so much is, I think I mentioned this in the previous video, but PYI have been absolutely amazing. I cannot speak highly enough of how amazing, like I didn't tell them I had a YouTube channel. I just called them up and said, hey, I'm an idiot and I'm converting my boat to electric. I don't know what the pitch was because I wasn't able to figure it out when I took it apart, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to electric, what should I do? And they were like, well, what boat and engine do you have? I told them, they were like, okay, you, I think it was like a 10 inch pitch. Let me check my notes. It originally came with a 10 inch pitch, meaning that one full rotation, if it was going through a relatively solid medium like sand, which of course you never do, but just for a thought experiment, one full rotation of the propeller would move it 10 inches forward. If you could imagine like the threads on a screw and the screw being turned into the wood, it's that kind of idea. The first gentleman I spoke to said, change it to 11 inches and try that. But he also said that we've got somebody else in the company who knows more about electrics and he recommended I talk to them. The guy called me, like that was like a Friday, the guy called me on a Monday and he spent like an hour on the phone with me. That guy, Fred, Fred, was it Fred? So Fred at PYI, who spent like an hour talking to me was like, oh, why don't you start with a 14 degree pitch and work your way up to a 16 degree pitch and see how it works. I asked them if they had ever done any kind of actual testing to see what pitch would be best. And he said, no, they hadn't. Um, but they understand propellers and they thought 14 degrees, 14 inches would be a good start. So one of the reasons I bought so much grease and spare screws, there's a hole in this bag. Whenever I order from DigiKey, I get way too many of these bags and I've been saving them because I never know when they're gonna come in handy and they're nice and thick bags. So that is now getting into this bag. Okay, so anyways, I have a whole bunch of spare screws, a whole bunch of, the lighting is terrible, but whatever. Got a whole bunch of squam spare cotter pins. I got a couple more of these. You don't tension bronze uh, bolts because they're just, it's the metal's too soft. So they use these pins to lock them into place to keep the bolt from backing off. So I've got a couple of those spare. The idea is that I am going to set it to 14 degrees when I put it in the water, run the tests. I'll go into more what the test will be. And then it's nice out. As you can tell, I'm not wearing my sweater. All my windows are open. So if you hear background noise, that's why. I'm gonna do a bunch of different tests, collect some data, and then with the boat still in the water, go under the boat, change the pitch on the propeller and put it back together. I am a klutz, so I bought a lot of spare parts because I am likely going to drop things while I'm underwater. So that's that. I also got, oh, you can really, I, I wish you could feel the difference in the weight. I've got two aluminum zincs. I've got two aluminum sacrificial anodes. The aluminum sacrificial anodes are good for freshwater and Lake Ontario is a freshwater body of water and I got three zincs which are good for salt water. The early versions of the Max Prop, you had to actually open them up and put grease inside. They have a way of drilling and tapping to put um, zerk fittings I think they're called so that I can put a attachment on it and use a grease gun to top up the grease. Well, period, but it works underwater. But some of it's gonna get washed out, obviously, which is why I bought four things of, um, of grease so I can change the pitch many times. When I first got this, I thought I was gonna to have to do that mod and I ordered the parts to do this mod. And then I found out it when I sanded off all of the paint. Oh, I should mention, I tried to get some video when I was sanding it and it turned out garbage. I can't use it. So you just get to see the end product. So. I've got the Zerk fittings, I've got plenty of spare parts, I've got lots of grease. I just need now to get in and get rid of all of this paint that's in the low spots. My original plan was that uh, you can get like these wire brushes that are supposed to be made of brass and I went to Canadian Tire, which it's a Canadian automotive parts store that has a fantastic reputation for nothing but the highest quality and the Canadians can stop laughing now. They had what I thought were brass um, wire brushes. And I picked them up and I looked at them because I noticed it didn't say brass on the cover, which if it was brass, why wouldn't you brag about that? Well, I flipped it over and I looked and it's brass coated steel. 
I wanted to make sure that whatever material I used was softer than the bronze on the propeller so that as I was grinding away trying to get the debris out, the metal on the brush would give way before the bronze on the prop. So brass covered steel strikes me as a scam because what, what's the point of having brass covered steel? The steel is heavier than the bronze and would cut the bronze. So I've got two brushes that are two, I'll show you more when I get downstairs, that should hopefully let me get the paint and stuff out without taking any more bronze off the, the actual propeller. The reason I hand sanded the whole thing was to make sure that I took as little metal off as possible. So for anyone who's been watching the channel for a long time, you know I do a lot of my Kinty interludes. And I'm not going to talk about this very long because I don't want to cry again. Um, if you recall, some videos back, Mr. Tatters suddenly went blind. And at the time, I, I mean, they, they told me that his blood pressure was really high and he had kidney disease. I knew what that meant. And I was going back and forth on, do I give him lots of treatment and special foods and whatnot to try to buy as much time as possible? Do I just spoil the hell out of him and make sure that he had as much quality as possible? Um, I had him on some supplements to, that helped. He didn't want to eat the, he didn't want to eat the kidney food to the point where he would just walk away from it. And eventually I gave in and put some of his regular food down and he purred like a, like a motorcycle eating it. Um, so I decided I wasn't gonna force that. I, I had some different types of medicine I could try. He, there's only one that he would actually take without a fight. So I spoiled him as best as I could. And the night after I finished recording the last video, I noticed that he, you know, he would normally sit in my lap for a while. He just immediately kept going back to the bathroom and he would just lay on the floor and he wasn't eating. I set up some cushions in the bathroom. I spent the night there. I wasn't sure if he was gonna make it through the night and by the morning I knew it was time to make the call. And yeah, so he's gone. I wanted to do a little co collage compilation something to should. This is what I didn't want to have happen. At some point I'll do a little compilation, but I can't do it right now. Just before I get back onto the propeller, and I'm, the video views when I'm doing stuff that's very boat related are way down from the technical videos I do. So I'm going to only mention this briefly because I suspect a lot of people who are most interested in this probably haven't watched this far. but. For those who watch all the time, I have got the second controller for the second motor. Um, Golden Motor, the Canadian reseller of them, I've been told a few times the motor should be here soon. I'm still waiting for it. Current message is that it should be here next week. We'll see. One of the things that's different with this one is you'll notice that it doesn't have the water block on the back. I don't think even driving the eight kilowatt at full power, this thing's going to need it because it only goes up to eight kilowatt, which is something like 156 amps. Um, and this can handle it, no problem. So this does not have the water block. What that also means is that I've now started playing with how I'm gonna do the cooling loop. I did get a water cooled five kilowatt. So I'm probably going to set up the cooling so that it goes through the controller to the five kilowatt, to the 10 kilowatt, to the radiator, and then back down through the pump and back into the first controller again. This one's gonna be air-cooled. In a pickle, I can use this to drive the 10 kilowatt if I ever had a failure of the, um, was it the KLS 72100NC? And C just means it's got the CAN bus option, so the N. This, for anyone playing at home, is the KLS 7275N um, TC. I'm not quite sure what the TC is. I know the C is CAN bus option. Originally, I was playing with the idea of trying to be able to run these together so I could run both motors at the same time. I mentioned in the last Helm video, I've given up on that idea. So yes, they've got CAN bus. I'll probably use that for monitoring, but I won't be using it to linking the controllers anymore. Also, on my last trip to the States, I stopped at a Chandlery and I found much cheaper than I could find here in Canada, um, wire by the foot. So I got three feet of two-aught 
This will be the, this brings me to ABYC standards for powering the 10 kilowatt motor. And this is two, ga or, sorry, two gauge, which is what I need for powering the five kilowatt motor. Is there anything else before? Oh, yes, there is. The momentary contact switches that I said weren't going to be here until September. So that's what Mauser told me. They showed up while I was traveling. I also got a second slash backup um, uh, Nucleo board. So if anything happens to this one, I could just update the, or load the latest firmware on here and get right back to work. Oh, one other thing, insurance. Still not solved, but I have a lead. My broker has just, bless his heart, he's never given up on me. I, I when it's all sorted out, I'm gonna, I wanna go do an interview with him or something because it's just been, it's an ordeal and he's been amazing. He's got two leads currently. One of them, it's a company called Haggerty's that does classic cars usually, but they do classic boats. They might be willing to cover the boat during the refit while it's on the hard. So not letting me go in the water until I get a, um, a marine survey after the conversion is complete, but they'll cover me. Um, there, there might be restrictions like if the conversion itself causes damage, that won't be covered, but at least if I fall over or if I somehow damage other people's boats, that will be covered. Fingers crossed, that's going. If they say no, there's another company that might cover me. So still working on that. Now, is there anything else before I go downstairs? Yeah, there's lots of stuff, but I think that's enough for now. So for me, I need to go set up. For you, so it's been a while since I've been in the shop. I mean, not in real life, but on camera. But I wanna use the pillar drill. I was originally gonna to try to use the hand drill, but then I was trying to think how to hold the propeller and use the hand drill. And I came to the realization, why don't I just fix this in the pillar drill? And then I can, th this will be held and I can just move the prop around. There's some of the worst of the pitting. So I have two different types of wheels that I'm gonna to use to try to clean it. Oh, the camera's too close. I have two types of wheels that I'm gonna to use to try to clean it. This one here is, I think it was like acrylic. It's some sort of plastic wheel. Max 4,500 RPM, wear eye protection. I already took the case off. Anyways, it's like a plastic. It's only the highest quality. I did a test mount and already some fins are falling off, but there you go. And yes, I do have my safety gurgles on. This one, it didn't really say what it was made of, but it feels soft. It's kind of like a super dense sponge. I'm hoping these will fail before the bronze will. I want these to break apart before the bronze gets cut off. I have no idea how loud this is going to be, so I'm just going to turn on the camera. I've got the DJI going and uh, see if I can make something interesting out of it. I'm going to start off with the plastic one first. I've never actually changed the belts before, but I want to set this to the lowest RPM possible. No, oh, I can't even get it open. Okay, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, that's not going super fast. You can see I can touch it and it doesn't hurt. Yeah, it's polishing the metal, but it's not taking metal off, I don't think. Is it taking metal off? There's a bit of pink on there, but I think that's coming from the plastic. The other thing I need to be careful about is not letting this get too hot. I don't think I'm gonna get it anywhere and hot enough that it could start to heat treat it, but I am being mindful of that. I'll show you how it's looking so far. There we go. So there's a bit of pinking here, which I know can be a sign. Oh, no, focus on the prop, not me. I know that, um, if bronze starts to turn pink, it can be a sign of corrosion, but I think that's just because that was the first part I hit with the plastic and the plastic's red. But you can see I'm starting to get the uh, stuff off. I think I should be getting a mask. I'm seeing dust coming off of this. I just need to figure out what I did with it. Oh, it's filming off my eyeballs. There we go. Oh, someday this place will be finished. Just in time for me to rent it out for some other oh, it is, for someone else to enjoy.
That one's starting to warm up a fair bit, so I'm gonna swap it, but you can see. I look like an idiot, but at least you can hear me better now. Okay, it's not really wanting to focus on this light, but most of the paint, can you please focus? Okay, I'm gonna have to do this upstairs. Anyways, most of the paint's gone, but it was getting, I mean, I can still hold it, but I can definitely tell it's getting warm. So I'm gonna switch to a different, different blade before I do the backside. But so far, it's working good. Oh, also, I don't know if you can see it on camera, but two things. One, there's no dust until I get to the paint, and then there's dust, which tells me it's not cutting the bronze. Perfect. Second thing is, the other benefit to this plastic is I popped off and my hand went into the grinder, because, you know, I'm smart like that. No harm, no injury. Another benefit of using plastic. Sweating so much, I think I know what it's like to have a beard for a minute. I don't know how well this is going to come through if I hold it up, so I'm going to try to use the camera. I might just do the, this upstairs. Let me see if I can show you how it looks now. Okay. So now you can see a little bit better. The patterning is just because of the rub marks. It feels like, at worst, there's one, maybe two millimeters at some of the deeper parts, like right here, there's some fairly deep crevicing, but it's not super bad. I mean, clearly it's not great, but you can see the paint is gone. I mean, it feels rough. It's, it's not a smooth surface. Like right there, that's, that's one of the deeper spots. I don't know if I can show you that. That feels like a solid one millimeter. So, yeah, I mean, it is not a new prop, that is to be sure. Yeah, there's some crevicing here. This might be a touch over one millimeter. But all in all, I'm no expert on propellers, so I can't really say for sure, but I don't think it's that bad. This here, there's a little bit of crevicing, nothing serious. I could clean this one up because I want to experiment with filling this. So this is not very important when it comes to hydrodynamic efficiency. I don't know what the hell the word is, but something like that. It really doesn't want to focus. You can see that kind of crevicing there. This is going to be what I'm going to practice on. And if it goes well with the epoxy, then I'll move to these. Again, the goal is just to make it so that it's a consistent surface because when I'm doing my testing, I want to have as little turbulence as possible. Oh, I broke a nail. Figures. All right. I'll see you in the morning. does not like this lighting. It is really nice to have friends with tools nearby. Let me reposition you. All right. The idea is to use a sandblaster. This cheap Nerf knockoff looking thing is a gravity fed one that I'm gonna put walnut shell medium. I should get something nicer to put those on. This will do. For my day job, I often get pallets. It's a piece of uh, broken um, pallet. I just said the word. The idea is, I don't know if it's gonna come through very well, but after using the nylon brush, this has got a very smooth surface. Nothing's gonna wanna stick to it. Originally, my plan had been to just get some really aggressive sandpaper, 40 grit, 60 grit, 32 grit, whatever I could get and just scour it up so that the epoxy filler has something to key into. And I was talking to my friend Damien and he was saying yesterday, that's not gonna be good enough. He's like, every time I've tried to do any kind of epoxy or paint on metal and I didn't sandblast it, it came off. He was saying that if you, if you sand it with sandpaper, what you create long thin grooves which don't key as well. The idea behind the walnut shot is that as it's shot in, it creates a whole bunch of little craters. It pushes the metal out of the way and it creates like a moon rock type effect, which apparently is a lot better for both the epoxy to key into, but also the prop speed that I put in afterwards. 
The idea behind using walnut instead of sand or glass, like you would normally use, is that, again, because bronze is, shower, is soft, much like how I didn't want to use the brass coated metal wiring, I don't want to take any material off. And when I'm sandblasting, I don't want to knock any bronze off. I just want to reshape it so that it keys better for the epoxy. Now, the last and only time I did sandblasting, or walnut blasting as the case might be, was in 1996 or 1997. That was in a cabinet with proper sand. I've never done this before. I have no idea how this is going to work. I know that it's messy as hell, which is why you're with me outside in the carport. I'm gonna put my mask on, even though the metal shouldn't be coming off, and this is walnut, I'm not too terribly concerned about toxicity, but I also just don't wanna be breathing in dust, and I can still see there's a little bit of paint. I don't know, am I gonna, I might do it like that and try to hit it. I... I, yeah, I'm figuring this out as I go. Um, also, I'm borrowing my neighbor slash woodworking teacher's compressor. When I fire it up, he says it's not working really well, so it might run a lot. And if that's the case, you're not going to hear anything. So depending on how loud it is, I may just mute it out and put some music over this. So I'm setting it to 90 PSI. It's currently showing 110 PSI. So this should not turn on right away. Adjust it with this. It's on. It's powered. I think we're good to go. Oh, the PPE. There we go. Wow, okay, that uh, blows back on your face really hard. Okay, I need my actual face shield. A, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. And B, it's just bouncing back and hitting me in the face. I've got this set to 90 PSI, which is what this gun is said to be, supposed to be set to. Uh, am I doing something wrong? Okay, I can't do anything until I get my face shield because it's just right back in my face. I'll be right back. Found it. Hey. Those guns are really slow. So no matter what you do, those guns are really slow. You'll, you'll hate using it, but it's the right thing to use. Um, okay. So don't, don't freak out about slow progress using those guns. The other side of it is um, I've never seen walnut being used, so I don't know anything about that. To me, it seems like it's way too soft. I would use, I'd be using gun and something hard, sand. Really? You want, you want, yeah, because you want it to be coarse. You want the surface to be rough as. So you can buy, uh, I can't remember the name of the rock, it's basically crushed rock and it's about, um, it's about twice as heavy as water, it's about two ton per square meter. Okay. Uh, per cubic meter. Um, it, and it's, it's hard as all fuck. Um, so when they crush it, it's really sharp. So what you want is hard and sharp and that, that is what dents the surface and rips everything off. So I'm wondering if people were telling me to use this because they're used to the idea of trying to strip paint off bronze without um, affecting the bronze at all. And where I want to key it. Yeah, maybe, maybe. You, you, want the, yeah, you want the harshness of the sharp rock. Well, shit. I, I could be wrong. I'm not a sandblaster. I don't, I don't know much about garden. You know more than I do, that's for sure. But, I, but if it was me, I'd be going for the hardest, most abrasive stuff I could find so that I could get the key happening. Okay. Honestly, I've used, I've used river sand on everything. Aluminium, wood, fucking steel, stainless. I, I just use it on everything because it gives you the right key. Okay. So river stone or garnet is what I need. Yeah, don't, don't ignore the river stone. That's just what we call it because that's what the garden shop sells it as. But it's basically garnet. All right, well, I'm gonna pack up and see if I can find a place that I can buy some uh, sand on a Saturday evening. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Alrighty. No worries. Talk Cheers. See ya, bye. So I'm gonna pack this up and see if I can find a place and buy myself some garnet uh, medium. And I'll save the walnut for something else. All right, I'll be back in a bit. So in real time, it's been about a week 
I wanted to get back to this sooner, but work's gonna work. So, I went to Princess Auto, which is our harbor freight for the Americans. Um, for everyone else, it's, it's a very discount store for farming goods, tools, and so forth. Um, you don't go there for top quality, you go there for inexpensive. But the upside is, is they have a lot of stuff that a lot of other stores don't carry, including sandblasting medium. Speaking to my friend Damien, he was saying, oh, you want to get garnet. It's what he's used for his boat, Brewpeg. So I looked on their website. They didn't have any at my local store, but they did have one at a store about an hour and some away. I said there was four bags, so I said screw it and drove down. They had none. So um, they didn't really have anyone there who could help me. So I sat there looking at my options and pulling up each one on the Googles and seeing what they had to say. I ended up getting copper slag. Now, as I understand it, copper slag doesn't actually have any copper. It's mostly iron or steel or something. Let me see if I can show you what it looks like. So it's a fairly fine grit and it's very hard, which I'm hoping means that when it strikes the bronze, it'll crater it, which is what I want to do. I want to make a texture for the epoxy key to. I have no idea if this is going to work. I have no idea if anything's going to work. How's that for an elegant background? Or after I finished recording last time and turned off the camera, I had been recommended to a company in the Toronto area that does um, propeller refinishing or refurbishing or whatever it is. I sent them an email and asked, listen, can you help me redo my prop? They were kind of a bit dismissive, so I'm not saying their name because I don't want to cause any drama, but um, they were like, well, we need to see it. So after doing all of the work I did um, to the end of last recording session, not last episode, I sent them a bunch of new pictures and said, you know, what would you quote me to clean these up? And they wrote back with no explanation saying, we're not interested. I'm guessing it's the same story as it was when I was trying to find somebody to help me with a diesel engine. It's too small of a project. Nobody wants to do it. So I have to make this work. If worse comes to worse, comes to worse, comes to worse, I'll rough it up with sandpaper, forget the epoxy and just prop speed it and throw it in the water. Like I said, the divots aren't that deep. I know the lighting isn't particularly great here, but yeah, I mean, there, it looks like there's a lot of surface issues, but it's not deep, and I don't think it would cause too much turbulence in the water. But I'm not keen <clears throat> to give up without trying my best. Also, my favorite screwdriver went missing a while ago. Couldn't find it anywhere. When I was down on the boat last week, I found it. Long time viewers, you remember when I left my uh, needle nose pliers up on the deck? for a couple of weeks. Yeah, I, uh, I did it again, and she is pretty grot now. So that's gonna get sandblasted as well. And then I'll hit it with some oil. Now, when I was trying to do the sandblasting with walnut shells, the spray got everywhere. There's literally not a part of my carport here that doesn't have walnut shells in it. This, it's walnut, it's organic, I don't care. And this is metal, to be fair, it's not gonna hurt anything, but before I get started, I'm gonna make a little cardboard enclosure. Um, I'm gonna do my best to try to set up the camera so you can still see in it. But the idea is to just basically, when it bounces off, it tries to stay relatively contained and I can vacuum it up afterwards. So I'm gonna build that first. I should probably put some shoes on too. Let me do that as well. I have shoes. With my day job, I not infrequently get things on pallets. And a lot of them have these big, nice pieces of cardboard at the bottom. I don't know why they put them there, but this is what I'm gonna try to use to make a little blasting cabinet. It's not gonna be a blasting cabinet, but anyways. This is hardly going to be scientific. Yeah, that's enough working space. So I think if I just cut this, cut this, and fold them over and tape it, that'll be good. I'd probably even mount a couple lights in it and make it a bit easier for you guys to see. Going. And now I'm not measuring anything. This is very much. <sighs> Let the spirits of your ancestors guide your knife kind of a build. I think that'll do. You can buy a basic sandblasting box for like 250 
Kanakistanian dollaroos, which isn't that much. Well, I mean, right now it is, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much. That, not that much. Okay. So something like that. I mean, some of the material is going to come back towards me and it's going to get in this area, but that should at least keep most of it in. I hope. It's, ooh, dark. This is what happens when the bright lights are behind you. Spooky. I hope, um, if worse comes to worse, then it gets everywhere like it was going to anyway. So, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I am going to try to get the light set up though. Oh, much better. My lord, it might just work. You know, I bet you if I had done it closer to the middle, I would have been okay with just one. Oops. Okay. Aha! That's gonna work fairly well. I'm gonna do the other side now. But you know what? One works. Haha! -ha. That'll help. Hopefully also help with the filming. I hope I don't ruin these lights. These are very... These lights make me happy. Okay. Let me go get my uh, PPPPPPE stuff on, change the battery because I see the battery is low, and then we'll come back and get started. I'm sure you can't hear anything I'm saying now, but uh, hi! <laughs> I look like a robot! I'm starting with just a little bit. Oh, that's working. Oh, that worked a treat. That works really well. It's gritty as hell. I need to oil it, but it works again. It's working, but this is going to take a long time. The problem I'm having is um, it drains the air out of that little tank faster than it can compress it. And once the pressure drops too low, I can see that it stops working. So it's a pressure issue. However, let me see if I can show you the difference. I don't know if the lighting is going to be good enough. Maybe I'll go out into the sunlight. I don't know how well this is coming through because I can't really see the screen. But you see the sparkling everywhere on this one? I hope you can see it. That is the roughed up surface. So that's exactly what I want the epoxy to key into. There's some places that I want to hit further, but this is already way better than how it was after I polished it with that wheel down on the uh, pillar jaw. See how much smoother and shinier it, is? shinier it is? So I think what I'm going to do is, this is already a pretty good rough pass. There's a little bit more I want to get right up in here I'll get that done and then I will switch to the other side. I'll get everything done that much at least. And then I'll see how much time and how much um, medium I have left. And then I'll see if I can key it up even more. But at least this way, I think at this point, I've already got enough of a key. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. I've never done this before, but there's certainly a key now. You've seen enough of what I'm doing. I don't think there's really a point in keeping the cameras running and just using up a whole lot of batteries and film. So I'm going to turn off the camera now and just keep at it. Um, I suspect I'm going to have to let the tank 
or the compressor cool down periodically. So I might be do a little bit and then turn it off like I'm doing right now to let it cool off, turn it on. Cause it's my neighbor's tank and uh, he's very kindly lending it to me and I don't want to be hard on it. For me, I've got hours of work ahead of me. For you, I'll bring you back as soon as I'm done. I have to give this video a very unsatisfactory ending. It is Friday afternoon, Friday coming up on Friday evening, and I have to leave tomorrow on another business trip. After I turned off the camera, the compressor had been down to 60 PSI, and so I left it charging and I went over to my neighbor to ask what its duty cycle was, how long could I leave it running? And he said that uh, one of the issues he has with it being a smaller tank is that it does overheat. So I came back, I turned it off, went in and made a coffee, came back out, and it wouldn't turn back on. Apparently it has like a lead slug or something, some kind of little metal in there that when it gets too hot that melts and it stops the compressor from working until it cools down enough that the metal solidifies. The label says that should take 20 minutes. It's been hours and it still hasn't come back on. I'm not going to be able to finish it before I leave and I want to edit this video while I'm traveling so I can get you guys something again. When I get back, I will continue doing the sandblasting, even if it's just a question of, I do one side of the blade a day, you know, it's five more days of work, but what can I do? I'm not gonna buy a new compressor to do one sandblasting job and, you know, my, my neighbor's being awesome lending me his thing, I, I gotta work within its limitations. Maybe I can figure out how to get it to run longer if I do shorter bursts and let it cool down so it doesn't actually melt that slug. The other thing is, I'll give you guys an update on, um, I've got the second controller, the smaller one, for the five kilowatt motor. So what I don't have yet is the motor. I ordered it the same day as the, ordered it in great English. I ordered it the same time I ordered the Kelly controller, which got here right away, props to Kelly. Um, the motor on the other hand, I, I've been told several times that it's gonna ship soon, it's gonna ship soon, it's gonna ship soon, never heard anything. Got an email yesterday saying it's gonna ship, just in time for me to leave. So I sent them a message asking them to ship it later so that it arrives after I get back. So in theory, I'll have the five kilowatt motor. I think the next video is going to be getting both of the motors and both of the controllers working together with the new helm controls. When I get back, I have a couple of weeks before I have to travel again, and I'm desperately gonna to try to take some time off work and really dig into the boat because as I said, it's, as I sit here, it's May 31st. The season is gonna pass me by if I don't get on my, uh, get on the boat real soon. And I'd be very, very sad panda if I don't get the boat in the water this year, but so projects go. All right, well, that's that. Um, I'd ask you to do the usual like and subscribe kind of thingy, but uh, <laughs> I have a feeling this video is not gonna be good enough to ask for that. Um, again, the, the channel's always been about documenting what a real project is like, and that means documenting the frustrating and struggling to make progress components. That's what this one is. Thank you for watching if you made it this far, and uh, hopefully I'll see you sooner than, than not. Um, I'm hoping I can get the next video out in less than two weeks, but we'll see. Thank you for watching. I'm the Digital Mermaid, and uh, yeah, bye. You should have had more time, Mr. Tatters. But at least we have a good last day.